right. Amen. And hey, welcome. I'm speaking to the entire church family today. And wow, big crowds here this morning, and I'm so excited. We're launching a new season in the life of our church. So I wanted to speak to everybody uh, just to give us a downbeat. I'm going to talk about a lot that's happening here in our church. So if you're a guest, we're glad that you're here. Uh, worship has been amazing uh, here. We praise God for Han and his team and for Stephen, our choir and orchestra, for Ronnie and our In Espanol uh, service. We're just so grateful for all that God has done. We ended our series last week, if you were with us, um, from the book of Hebrews. We've been in it all summer long, and it ended with this benediction. In fact, we sent you out, if you were here with us last week, grace be with you all, the last phrase in that book. And what I want to do, I want us to just bless each other again um, with that. So let's say it together in, in all of our services. Just say, grace be with you all. Now say it again to each other. Grace be with you all. This is more powerful than you might realize as we think about grace and what it really means and what it is. So throughout the next six weeks, we're going to talk about the central, I could argue, core reality of what God has done for us. And we're going to unpack this thing called grace. If it's such a big deal, we can't get underneath it enough. We can't scrutinize it enough. We can't study it enough. And we're prone to forget what God has done for us. And some of you here today, the light is going to come on. The light of grace is going to come on. And like it has for all of us who have received Christ and have been baptized and are members of our church, this is the thing that's changed our lives. So we're ending into a series of messages uh, called Everyday Grace. We're going to talk about how we live in this grace. How do we extend this grace in our schools? Okay, we start uh, school this week, many of you. Um, we, we, we do it in our homes. We do it in, in the workplace and in our most difficult relationships. How can we be a people of grace? Because that's what marks us the most, Right. And so this message is going to launch us into a series, and I want us, again, all on the same page today, so I'm going to be talking a lot about what's happening. Um, it's going to take us to September 17th, and then on the 24th, okay, on September the 24th, we're going to have, we're going to launch into a new series of messages, a, I think a kind of world historic moment for us in the life of our church as we enter into a series called Imagine. Okay, and again, if you're new around here, uh, certainly if you're a member, you're going to want to be here all through this series and the next because we're going to talk about imagining the future of our church. On the 24th, we're going to launch into that series with outdoor baptism after our services. So we'll just spill out from the Great Hall, from the sanctuary, outside where we're going to just be baptizing a whole bunch of people. And many of you already are saying, yes, I'm all in. Some of you can decide and come and decide you're going to do that today and find us after the service. But you're going to see that. It's going to launch us into this series because baptism is right at the heart of what it is to receive the grace of God and then to say to the world, as we've even seen this morning, what it is to die to ourselves and be raised up, forgiven, and to live for him. That series is going to go to October 22nd. I'm telling you this because, mark your calendar. On the 22nd, we're going to all come together in the sanctuary. We're going to pack the sanctuary, okay? One church, one mission, one Lord, all together. In Espanol, all of you Anglo people, wherever you're from, we're going to gather and we're going to worship God together. It's going to be at 10 o'clock on that day. You'll hear more about it. That one's going to spill out into the front lawn where we've got lunch on the lawn with Texas de Brazil. So uh, it won't be 100 degrees uh, by that time, we hope. That maybe some meat sweats, you know, will be breaking out as we enter into just a great time of fellowship out there. Hey, on that day, leading us in worship, the men of Nehemiah are going to be here on that day. Yes, so we're excited. One of our key partners here in the city, and it's going to be a great day. So you're back from the summer. I, I hope that you are back and here now for the weeks to come. Uh, on September 16th, we have a gathering of all Connect Group leaders uh, that's a Saturday morning. We're going to have breakfast together, training, because we want every one of our gatherings from start to finish, from the youngest to the oldest, to point us uh, to God's word. We connect with God's word. We connect with each other. We connect with the mission of the church. If you're not in a connect group, I'm just going to say it again. Key to our time here as a church, we gather for worship, yes, 
But you can get lost in a church our size. You, you dive into connect groups. You get to know one another and have brothers and sisters in the Lord. We're all reading together now, keeping each other accountable as we read through the book of Romans. All right. Now, some of you might have missed this. We started this week. We're only in chapter three tomorrow. So you can pick up your bookmark. Okay. If you're like me, enjoy checking it off when you do it. Um, not because we're working our way towards God's approval, but because it's great. And we're, we got shorter portions of the scriptures um, that we're reading because Romans is dense. So we're talking about grace and we unpack it there. Uh, Paul does for us in the book of Romans, maybe like nowhere else in scripture. All right. So this grace that has transformed our lives, it all starts right here in the body of Christ. So today I'm going to talk about grace in the church and we're going to talk about what it is to live in this alternative community. Um, we, we say, well, you know, we're exiles in, in Babylon. I mean, we are a colony of grace living in a crazy, chaotic, and broken world. And there's probably no better example of what this looks like than in the book of First Thessalonians. Okay, so grab your Bible and, and turn there. Everyone turn into First Thessalonians. Now, even as you're doing that, some of you are kind of um, shaken by the Bible. I mean, it's like, I, I don't even know where the First Thessalonians is. It's, it's daunting. So I want you to know that we are here to help you learn how to read your Bible. First, I want to challenge you to bring your Bible. Every time you gather here, it's the word of God. It's what points us to God's grace. We are in, in connect groups. We teach the word of God. But coming uh, September the 6th, we're launching all of our grow opportunities. You can grab one of these on your way out today. Every person needs to grab one of these. And it tells you all about the opportunities that we have for you. One of those opportunities, here we go. Um, we've got a new offering on Wednesday nights, among all the great things that you can choose from. 6.30 to 7.30, I'll be leading um, a Bible study, a gathering every Wednesday night in the fellowship hall uh, called the Pastor Study. And what we're going to do is you're kind of getting inside my head, my heart, even preparation, how I read the Bible. We're going to have other pastors and ministers there. We're going to be pointing you to resources where you can learn how to read the Bible for yourself. Yes, we do it in community, but we're going to talk every week about how that can happen. We're going to dive deeper into our dwell readings and look at some passages and some challenging concepts that we're going to see, uh, and we're going to dive deeper. We're going to pray together. Some of you just think old school Wednesday night, pastor's Bible study. Let's go. So we come together. You can come eat at the commons, send your kids off to all the good things. Um, and maybe that is a place where you can come and connect. We're going to pray for our church family. We're going to be together. It's going to be a great time. All that's on the website. All right. So let's jump in. First Thessalonians chapter one, beginning with verse one, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, all right? This is who's writing us to the church of the Thessalonians in God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And look at this. Here's how he starts. Launching from Hebrews into 1 Thessalonians here. Grace and peace to you. Now, friends, listen. This is more powerful than you realize. What if we really extended maybe those words literally to each other all the time. I had someone after the service, the last service, who said, okay, grace and peace to you this week. What if every time we encountered each other, if it wasn't those words, it was with that kind of a heart and posture towards each other. What do you need? How about this? Today, more than, think about it, grace and peace. And you know, anybody need peace today? With all the time, all the parents, raise your hand. Um, all the students, right? I mean, uh, school is starting Promotion day reminds us that our kids are growing up. And, and I've talked to several parents today who are like, whoo, it's happening. Here we go. How do you live with grace defining you and peace in your life? This is what we should, this is, should be our posture every time we encounter each other. Here in this, again, alternative community of grace. Hey, what I want for you, this is what we're saying when we encounter each other. I want for you today, more than anything else, man, I just want grace I just want you to be covered with the grace of God. I want to extend grace to you. I want you to know your love for free. I want you to experience peace in your life. I've said it before as your pastor, the thing I pray over people more than anything else in various ways or different words is peace because we all need this and we have opportunity to extend that kind of peace and grace to one another. So if grace is such a big deal, Let's get underneath it. Let's talk about it. We're going to answer three questions today. So if you take notes on sermons, um, 
whether you're in the sanctuary here or online, do, do this. The first one we're going to answer is what is it? What is grace? Okay. And, and secondly, we're going to talk about what does it look like? you know, on display, and then how do we share it? Because once you have this grace, you can't keep it to yourself. Um, I've referenced this book before, one of my favorite, I don't know if it's a top five maybe book of all time. I think probably the season I read it changed my life in so many ways. Uh, and it's What's So Amazing About Grace by Philip Yancey. Anybody read this book? Um, it's a great book. Some of you have. Um, it was written years ago, but in the book, he calls grace the last best word. Whenever I run across a person named Grace, like a, a girl or a woman, I'll say, yes, that's the last best word. He writes this, listen to this. He says, we keep circling back to grace because it is one grand theological word that has not spoiled. And he notes every English usage of the word can find uh, you know, and retains some glory of the original like a vast aquifer. The word underlies our proud civilization, reminding us that the good things in life come not from our own efforts, but rather by the grace of God. Even now, despite this secular drift, this was written, I think, back in the 90s. So this secular drift, he says this, tap roots still stretch towards grace. I mean, just listen to how we use the word and watch for it this week. The root word, gratis, you might know, shows up in the very best moments of our lives. We say grace before a meal to simply ask God and we acknowledge the gift of his grace to us in, in the simple form of food. We're grateful for someone's kindness. We're gratified by good news. We congratulate someone on their successes. We're gracious in hosting friends. When someone serves us with pleasure, we leave a gratuity. Grace shows up in places where these, this element of delight is for the undeserved. A, a figure skater performs a routine with such excellence, it seems with ease. We call it that she did it with such grace. And, and, and though it's not essential to a melody, a composer of music, We'll place a grace note in or grace notes that, that fall in, gratuitous notes that come into the score that we would miss otherwise. You see, grace is unpredictable, it's shocking, it's surprising, and we have the opportunity to, to live that way. One of the things I challenge you with, this is so fun, just look for opportunities to extend grace to someone this week, and you all do this so well, but this is a fun game to play. Like, I'm going to shock you right now with some kind of love. You weren't anticipating that I would open the door. You weren't thinking that I was going to let you go first. I, I'm going to show you the radical love of God in how I, I'm going to act towards you. Stunning amounts of grace come from God's people. And it's what sets us apart. And so in a world where we see power and dominance is often the way, grace is right in sync with the way of Jesus. And this is the thing that should mark us, and I believe does mark us. I'm gonna talk about that today. I believe that this marks us as a church family, that grace is our message. It's what motivates us. It's what we share with other people. It's one-way love. We say it's preemptive love that's come to us. And this week in our Dwell reading plan, we saw a verse, Romans 1:17. and if you didn't read it, um, here it is, because this verse, not only is this the, um, gosh, the, the premise of all the book of Romans, the whole book, but it's also the verse that catapulted, sparked the Reformation. You can read about Martin Luther's story in a lot of places. There's movies and such out, but a Roland Bainton wrote a classic um, biography of Martin Luther called Here I Stand. And in it, he shares this story where Romans, out of Romans chapter one, verse 17, it says this, for in it, okay, in the gospel, in the good news of Jesus, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith or faith from faith. That is to say faith from first to last and all the way through. It's faith all the way through. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. 
Now, this little known uh, priest in Germany, in Wittenberg, he, uh, Martin Luther, read this and it stopped him in his tracks. And he wondered, what does it mean the righteous shall live by faith? What does this mean? Of course, hearkening back to the Old Testament and Abraham, who was reckoned as righteous. And he discovered a linguistic trick that changed everything for him. Now, he's reading the Latin, okay? So he's reading the Latin, and the word that we use for justification, even in English, the Latin word is justificare. Justice, you hear that word, justice, which is righteousness, okay? To be right, to be made right. Justice and Ficare is, is the verb. It's an infinitive. It's to make righteous. And Martin Luther had been taught, okay, through his, his upbringing and Catholicism, that you, you are made righteous by the works that you do, the sacraments of the church. So in other words, you're saved. Okay, Jesus, yes, but it's through the sacraments of the church that you gain this faith, okay, this righteousness. It's through uh, the Eucharist. It's through baptism. It's through confession. It's through paying penance. And though some of us here are, are Catholic or formerly Catholic, a lot of us still in some form live this way. I was talking to a young girl two weeks ago, 20 years old. I was speaking on... Talking about grace, the grace of God and how it cha changes our lives. Like, what else do we have to share, right? And so I was speaking to this group of young, all of them, about 20-something, maybe some teenagers. And, and she hanging out afterwards, and her mind is being blown by this concept of grace. I'm watching the light come on with this girl. Margie's telling me with a friend. She hangs out afterwards, and she says, so I, tell me, I'm still trying to get my mind around this. And she was Catholic, Okay. Um, and so she, she's going, I've been taught all my life that it's through, literally, she said, through the sacraments, okay, through the rituals of the church, that that's where faith comes from. Like you do these things as if it positions you, I suppose, to, to, to be and to receive faith from God. It's, you know, being baptized as a baby. It's, it's taking the Eucharist. It's penance. It's, it's confession. It's all those things. And through that, then, you have this faith that results in righteousness. I said, okay, no, because you're, you're actually getting, and I think the light has come on with based on what she's already said. And, and I said, no, no, grace is something that comes to you apart from anything that you do related to the church or not. It's, it's a gift from God and you receive it by faith. So Luther, watch this, he's reading the Latin, but now he's reading in his moment of awakening, he's reading the Greek. All right. What he discovers, because see, justificare was a word that was taken from the Roman uh, judicial system, okay, where someone is being made right by paying a penance or paying off some debt. And he says, now he's looking at the Greek. And watch this. This is why these little nuances are so important. For him, brilliant man, by the way, who ends up translating the, the Latin Vulgate, no, from the Greek to to German in like a short period of time, but he sees the word dikaios. Dikaiosune is another word, righteousness in the Greek. In the Greek, the word doesn't mean to make righteous. It, it, and it doesn't mean the righteousness that belongs to God, but it's a righteousness that actually he gives to us. Yes, he is righteous, but it means to regard or to count someone as righteous. It's to, we say, reckon as righteous. To declare as righteous. Apart from anything that you've done. It's what Martin Luther says. When he, when he discovered this, that he says, wait, wait, wait. There's a righteousness that's outside of me. Extra nos, okay, in the Latin, outside of us. That, that is what he called justitia alienum. It's an alien righteousness. It's a righteousness that's not from me. It doesn't come from what I'm doing. It comes from God who gives me righteousness. He blesses me and declares me righteous. When he discovered that there's a righteousness that is not something that I do, but instead a gift from God, when he discovered this, he writes this. Look at this. When I discovered that, I was born again of the Holy Spirit. The guy's a priest, okay? Okay. And the doors of paradise swung open 
and I walked through. I'm curious. My friend Margie was walking through the same door. How many of you have walked through, just by show of hands, how many of you walked through this, this door when you discovered the grace of God? Just raise your hand if you've walked through that door. Because you've experienced this grace awakening that changes everything. And it happens over and over again. I'm still blown away by the grace of God. You know, and when I thought, well, I get it now. Wow, this is mind blowing. And I continue to discover, oh, it's bigger than I've ever imagined. It's greater than I've ever known. And so grace comes to you. Look at this. It works in you and then it flows from you. All right. So what does it look like? Okay. If, it, if grace is a free gift from God, well, Paul tells us that this grace that's on display in the church. Now you need to know this context matters in Acts 17. You can read the story of how this uh, church was established. Paul has this dream. He's going off to Macedonia. On his way, he's, he's sidetracked. He ends up in Thessalonica for three weeks, it says. And he's preaching the gospel of grace. And he's telling them that Jesus, who, was, who died on the cross, was, is actually the Messiah. And he's telling all of the people there. And it causes quite a ruckus. In fact, big mob breaks out. I mean, violence coming towards Paul and Silas. They have to, they have to bolt because they hear him talking about Jesus as king, as if there's another king. Thessalonica was this free city. It was very much a Roman city paying homage to, to Caesar, who was Lord of the day. So he comes in and he's threatening the powers. When you speak truth to power, you get in trouble. Paul and Silas have to leave by night and he leaves. He goes to Berea after that and, he received, and he welcomed, he's welcomed there like I'm feeling today, always from our church family saying, tell us more, tell us more. This is so good. We need more of this message of the gospel. And he finds that in, in Berea. But what happens is he sent out uh, violence. It really forces him out. And then he sends Timothy to say, hey, about a year later, what has happened in Thessalonica? Because we left them in disarray. It was crazy. And he's assuming that the church has kind of fizzled and fallen apart. But in the face of opposition and persecution, he finds out from Timothy that they're actually flourishing. And that's what prompts this letter that we're reading today. Look at verse 2 in that context. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. I love that. We should have that posture towards each other. I know this. I praise God for you, uh, I, our church family. I praise the Lord. And I don't just praise God for the concept of the church or the big ch or the Park City's Baptist church. I praise God for you. I praise God for the people. And, and even, even last night, Stacy and I just praying, just Lord, thank you for our church family. We praise God for you. I resonate with Paul here. He loves this church. And, and he, he, he says, I just praise God. I continually mention you in our prayers. We're constantly praying for you. And I see this kind of love towards one another on full display every day throughout the week, every Sunday that we gather. And if you're a guest here, I hope you felt that today. This is a place of grace, a place where you can receive grace and peace. I saw it last week when we gathered all of our next-gen leaders to be ready for this promotion Sunday and to raise up our preschoolers, our children, and our students to know the Lord and to serve him. And, and I saw it on Wednesday when we gathered, packed the chapel with members of our church and people from our community to celebrate the amazing life of Sally Davis, who was for years one of our um, Bible teachers, respected and loved Bible teachers, particularly among our women. And we were there to be with Dick and his family and to celebrate her life. I saw it um, a couple of weeks ago when I, I saw a, a connect group had been coming around a family, young family in our church, had a one-year-old been walking through chemo and then uh, now have a newborn and how the church has circled around them and helped serve them out of a connect group. Friends, if you're not in a group, you need to be in one because what an unspeakable gift it is to have brothers and sisters in your life but that's going to take you taking some steps. And today may be the great challenge. And now is a good time to join a connect group or visit some because everybody's new. Some of us are moving different hours and such. Some are serving. Now's the time, okay? Uh, and I want to encourage you to, you've heard about an opportunity we have to bless the Peterson family. Pike Peterson, 
um, 13 year old, got back from youth camp and he was diagnosed with uh, acute myeloid leukemia. And in two weeks on the 27th, we're gonna have the opportunity to see if we could be a donor. We're believing the donors among us. He needs a bone marrow transplant. And we're gonna be in the gym nine to three on that Sunday, and you can have an opportunity, just a simple swab to say, hey, I might could do this. I might could be the one to help him get back to health. This is what the church does. Look at verse three. We remember before our God and Father, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't this amazing? Look at this. What does the church look like? No, what does it look like for us, each of us? What does grace look like on display? He mentions three things. You catch it? It looks like faith that works. Okay, so works don't save us. We're saved by faith, but saving faith never comes alone because our works, our obedience to God is a response to his grace that he's extended to us. So our faith leads to obedience, right? We don't obey him, uh, obey him to gain acceptance. We obey him because we already have it. Changes our motivation completely. You see that? There's a completely, di- we're motivated by love. Look at what it says, love that labors. He says, it's faith that works. Grace looks like love that labors. It's prompted by love. And it looks like hope that endures. These people have gone through persecution. And this is where a lot of Christians in America today aren't doing real well. We continue to press on with grace and with love because the hope that we have in Jesus uh, means that we're living as if we're already experiencing freedom from it all. It's already set in motion. And so we live by grace and and it's shown in our lives. How are you doing that in these days? In, In your most, you know, central relationships, what does faith look like at work in your life? Love that labors, hope that endures. Are you enduring these days? Are you persevering with hope? Are you going back to the gospel to say, yes, give me hope? Because friends, listen, the best is yet to come in him, always yet to come. So that's what it looks like. So how do we share it? Because once you have this grace, you can't but share it with others. Look at verse four, all right? For we know, look at how they received it. Brothers and sisters, loved by God that he has chosen you because our gospel, okay, this good news, came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. So he's saying, hey, we came incarnationally in the presence, in bodily form. We were among you and we lived with you. We loved you. He says, you became imitators for of us and of the Lord. For you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. Okay. So again, thinking about your own life and yes, us as a church, how do we share the gospel? How is it shared? Okay, first, look at this. Did you catch it? With words, all right? With words. And we, I know we laugh a little bit, but some of you know, St. Francis of Assisi was attributed with saying, um, share the gospel, you know, always, and when necessary, use words. I get the sentiment. But no, the gospel demands words. You can't, sh- my good works has never saved anybody. To say that Jesus did the work, that he lived the perfect life for me as a substitute for me. He died on the cross for my sin. He took away my sin. I didn't do anything. He died on the cross. He was buried and raised again. Not simply to prove that he is God in the flesh and all that he said is true. But that he would be the first one, the first installment of the resurrection to come. That demands words. The gospel comes with words. So friends, I just challenge you. When's the last time you shared the gospel? I'm not just talking about, you know, well, here's what's up or I went on this trip or here's what God, maybe here's what God's doing in my life. Yes, yes. But at some point we've got to get to the point where we're saying, this is what God has done for us. Friends, we go forth now to look for opportunities to do so. And Promotion Sunday reminds us that our kids are growing up. And we want them nothing more than, than, more than anything. We want them to grow in grace. Amen? Amen? Parents, 
your kids are going off to school. I've talked to so many. I know that many of us are preparing and we're, all re- and we're already getting, feeling it, right? You're feeling it. But I want to ask you, with all the sports, with all the things that you push your ch- child to, and yes, education matters, all the things, are you helping them grow in grace? The most important thing they can learn and know. I challenge you to be here. Make church and the gathering a priority for your family. You're making school a priority, and you're probably on time. You, you, make, you make all kinds of things priority. You're outsourcing things to your kids so they can learn how to do this, and you're getting them the tutors and whatever else. Are you focused and teaching them that church, the body of Christ, is priority for you? And in a parent-centered family, the parents are running the show. And it's what we do as a family, right? And so just continue. I just challenge you in the plan now. Start today. Plan will be here next week. And then be here the next week and the next. I am so excited about our next-gen team who lead our preschoolers, children, and youth and all that we have for them. And the way that we have ramped up all things on Sunday morning. And if you hadn't met Lisetta Lair, who's our new preschool minister working alongside Marty, uh, but can t- you need to meet her uh, caring for the youngest ones among us because we want them to know the grace of God. So the grace of God comes with words. Okay. The gospel comes with words. It comes with power. You see this? And I think Paul is referencing in part uh, some of the miracles and things that came with the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And, and, and what we talked about last week is for us, it means, see, think about this. If you can't change the state of things in your life, That's powerlessness. That's not power. But for those of us who have access to resource, knowledge, or to to the grace of God, we are able to give that access to others. That's what power looks like in the kingdom. It's flipped so that we show up and say, hey, you don't have what I know you need. And friends, I just want to say this. I want to rattle off a few things to say how I join Paul as he's praising God for the Thessalonians. I can praise God for our church family. Because over and over again, and and I just start a few things and I, I can't even tell you what our church is doing. And I know each of you are doing out in the world, but together, Hearts for Kids down in South Texas, They praise God for Park City's Baptist Church. Caring for for children and families. Our our team was down there this week. We we were down at uh, the BSM uh, where we're going to be. I'm going on a men's group uh, trip here uh, in a few weeks at UTRGV, um, Rio Grande Valley, where there's an incredible Baptist student ministry going on there. We're going to be there with the students. They're blessing the whole campus over and over again. Uh, we, We just launched... A, um, a, a family hope center down there with Buckner in Donna. Some of y'all been down there. Gang, they praise God for Park City's Baptist Church. And, 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 and when I look at the church pastoral center over the past four years, we've launched 25 church planters out to launch churches and to plant. And they're in the process of doing so. 15 churches have been established in the Dallas area through our church planning center. Those people praising God for Park City's Baptist Church, remembering us in their prayers of praise. Uh, and when I think of the Potter's House um, International down in Guatemala, where we serve those who live literally off the dump. When I think of Cornerstone Church, again, the men of Nehemiah, they thank God for Park City's Baptist Church. We just gave, um, through our missions committee, your giving $100,000 committed to the men of Nehemiah to establish new facilities for that ministry that we helped launch. They praise God for Park City's Baptist Church. Jack Lowe Elementary, 40 teachers being adopted, 600 backpacks, friends, that we have put together for them. Many of you were part of that just a couple of weeks ago. Out of the Bob Herrera um, Mission Center there, we're serving 85 families. We're serving food to them every week. And the ministry that's going on there is incredible. I could go on and on. Lighthouse for Christ, African Christian Outreach, long partners in in Africa, in Kenya. We've launched 304 churches in Nepal through our partners there. Uh, It's just amazing. 25,000 people have been baptized in places where the gospel was not preached formally. And friends, we have an opportunity to be a part of this. Giving access to people to share the gospel and bringing access to our children and to our students, to the youngest ones among us. We are here, gang, listen. 
Those of us who are older, we are here to pass the gospel on to the next generation. That's what our mission is. And that's what we're going to continue to do in the days to come. We're blessed to be a blessing. Look at this. It comes with words. It comes with power. It comes with conviction. You catch that? We're going to stand on the truth of God as a church. We're not going to back away. Because as it gets darker, the truth and the light of the gospel shines brighter. And look at what he says. You might be, seeing, you might be thinking, well, Jeff, I, and I'm not trying to shame anybody or beat you down. I'm trying to challenge you. You're saying, well, I don't know if I could do that. I mean, I don't know if I could take care of preschoolers. I don't know if I, or middle school, I don't know if that's my, that's my thing. I don't know if I could sing, you know, in the choir or on a praise team. Or I, I, I don't know what my, where my place is. Friends, find your place. Let us help you find your place. But here's the thing. If you feel ill-equipped, check this out. Look at what he says. All of this is done in the power of the Holy Spirit. The weaker you are, the greater God's power shows up. So if you feel ill-equipped, you're just positioned to step in. I don't know what to say. The Spirit gives you words to say. I don't know where my place is. Okay, watch this. Some of you have a calling on your life. I've talked to several already this morning. And you're like, I want God to speak to me. I don't know. Maybe he's going to tell me something. Look, God's waiting on you. He's waiting on you because here's how faith works. You step into that space, and that's when God says, yes, now let's go. Let's do this. I mean, God changes our lives and he calls us into something altogether new. What does this look like? What's the result of it all? And if we had time, we could go into verses seven through 10 where he says, okay, you all, here's what's happened. And I would say this to, to us. You've become a model, Park City's Baptist Church. You've become a model to Dallas and to Texas. He says, Macedonia and Achaia. You, you, the gospel has rung out it's this centrifugal force that's going out from you. And friends, we have an opportunity to bring more people into this and what God's doing. He says, they tell of how you turned, this is verse nine, he says, you turned from, to God from idols to serve the living and true God. I can say this about us. You, you've turned from materialism. You've turned from racism. We've turned from, from, we've turned from nationalism. We, we've turned from all of the isms and we have said Christ is Lord of our lives. And he's the one that drives us. He is the one true God. We don't bow to anyone else. We, he's the one who has rescued us, he says, from the coming wrath, from the justice that is due every person who's not received the grace of God. And so friends, as we close our time, I'm gonna pray with you that we will be the church that God's called us to be. And if you've never received this grace, I want to give you opportunity to do so even now. All right, let's pray together. And I just want us all to close our eyes, wherever you're watching or listening. And I want you to just bow your head and just, I want to ask you, have you received his grace? Do you know what he's done for you? Maybe today the light has come on. And I trust that those of you who raised your hands earlier, it, it, is it's shining a little brighter today because you've come to realize that there is a, there's a grace, a righteousness that's come outside of us and that Jesus is the one who has brought it to us. And so friend, if you've never received Christ, you can do it right now. Take that step of faith. It's a step of faith. Say, Lord, come into my life. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I receive your gift of grace. Thank you that I'm justified by what you have done. And I receive your good news. Lord, change my life. I'm sorry for the way I've been living. I just want my life to be one big thank you for all that you've accomplished. This is love. And I receive it. Lord, I pray that we'll be a church known for grace, not simply when we gather, yes, but as we scatter into the world today and this week, into our schools, our homes, that we'll be a people of grace. And mark our lives for you have done so much for us and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.